Isaiah 25 begins, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all their faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain but Moab will be trampled under him as straw is trampled down in the manure. They will spread out their hands in it as swimmers spread out their hands to swim. God will bring down their pride despite the cleverness of their hands. He will bring down your high fortified walls and lay them low. He will bring them down to the ground, to the very dust. Let's thank God for his word and pray that we will learn from it as we're spoken to now. Thank you, John. So, sorry, I thought you were going to pray then. You, you fooled me. But no. um, excellent. I trust that everyone at home, you Zoomers, not Boomers, but Zoomers, uh, can hear me. Um, and hope that uh, everything works out well for us this morning, technically. Yes, I'm on. Good. Excellent. Great. Uh, morning, everybody. Great to see you all. You are wearing masks, which feels like you're not allowed to talk, but I want to encourage you, you actually can. In fact, the mask is kind of so you can. So uh, feel, don't feel uh, hindered by that. Um, yeah, I'd... Invite, well, to a degree, to a limit, I invite comments, heckling. Um, just not from Rick. Uh, we are looking at Isaiah chapter 25 this morning. I'm going to try and give you a little bit of an idea of what this kind of section of Isaiah, it's a huge book, 66 chapters. This sits in kind of the second main section of Isaiah from chapters 13 to 27. Uh, and we're looking, as Anthony said, kind of at judgment and salvation. And I want to say they're kind of the two sides of the same coin. Um, one of the things I love about living where we do in Sydney is that we're close to the coast, but not too co close. Um, Sarah and I love when there's a big storm, we love going down to Maroubra and just witnessing the immense power of the ocean and really witnessing the immense power of God displayed on, in the ocean. Uh, these massive waves, partly because I can't swim, so they totally freak me out, but these massive waves that roll in and just have such huge power to wash away everything in their path. Now, last month, uh, in, yeah, last month, uh, we had some massive storms that lashed the east coast of Australia up and down New South Wales. There was these storms that combined with these king tides to wash away enormous sections of uh, the coastline. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of those pictures, 
but lots of houses uh, lost their decks, lost swimming pools, lost a lot of their property as well. Um, some of those houses you still can't go into. Uh, they're basically worthless now because of this immense power of the ocean that has driven away so much of their land. Now this combination of this kind of proud optimism of building right on the beach, on the sand, thinking it'll all be okay, uh, I've got enough money to handle it, uh, and some poor planning from councils has meant that uh, these homes are in danger of being swallowed up by the sea, being just washed away by this relentless, incredible pressure that comes from the ocean. Now that, that picture of devastation, uh, I think gives us a little window into the judgment that Isaiah talks about uh, in the book of Isaiah uh, that the Lord will bring. Uh, there's two major themes of judgment and salvation that often come together. God's judgment is like this inescapable storm uh, that threatens to wash away everything that tries to stand against it. Now, today we're looking at this passage which contains one of my favourite passages of scripture. Uh, honestly, I absolutely love it. Um, it's a beautiful picture of hope and the salvation that Jesus offered and, and he loves this passage too himself. And yet, so often, as is the case in Scripture, it comes in the context of actual terrible judgment. Um, so, hmm, that's not going to work for me. That's the one. Um, so, so that we can understand the beauty of the salvation that's offered, I think it's helpful for us to understand the context of what we find in Isaiah. So, my outline today, I'm restoring orthodoxy. We're going back to three points just so that everyone's comfortable. Owen, there'll be words. Um, we're looking at the judgment on, on the proud. That's our first point. Judgment on the proud. Secondly, praise for God. And thirdly, salvation for the humble. A little bit of a reverse order in terms of the passage. Uh, judgment on the proud is verses 9 to 12. Praise for God is verses uh, 1 through to 5. And then salvation for the humble is verses 6 to 8, that middle section. Now, as I said, this comes in this section from the stretches from chapters 13 to 27. And here, in this section, Isaiah surveys the nations around the nation of Judah. Now, remember where we are? Israel has been split into two parts. You've got the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom. There's more of them, so they get to keep the name Israel. Uh, and yet, what we need to remember here is that Judah is small fry. I think we can forget that a little bit because... You know, we read the Bible and it's all about what God's doing through his people. But in the context of the world at the time, Judah's small fry. Uh, they're a little nation uh, compared to the ones around them. They're small, they don't have a standing army, they're agricultural, they're, they're very weak. Uh, especially when you compare them to the superpowers that are at work in the region at the time. You've got Assyria, uh, which is huge, has this empire that's extending, it's growing. And so what do you do if you're a small nation... And there's an enormous superpower threatening you. Well, you, you know, it makes sense to band together with the other small guys. Okay? Like, we can't beat them by ourselves. But maybe with some, some of the other guys, if we work together, we'll be able to stand against them. And in normal circumstances, you'd say, that just makes sense, doesn't it? Like, that's, that's pretty sensible. Uh, you make alliances so that you can stand. Right? That's wise, we would say. Right? Wrong. Wrong, says God. No. Uh, not if your God is the true and living God. Not if your God is the God of the nations. But you can just imagine the political pressure that there would have been on the leadership in Judah to make those alliances. But this is Isaiah's message in this first part, in chapters 13 to 23. It's very simple. He's saying, don't put your trust in the nations around you. Don't put your trust in them. And what he does is give these a series of oracles or prophecies against the nations surrounding Judah. And he says, every single one of these nations will fall. Don't put your confidence in them. Trust me. That's the kind of little summary of those 11 chapters. 
And then in chapters 24 to 27, Isaiah's scope goes even wider, where he goes from kind of the ancient Near East region to looking at the world as a whole, all nations, all time. All right, so if you've got your Bible open there, this is one of those moments where it's kind of helpful, actually, to have a paper Bible. I know they're heavy and awkward, but because uh, you can flick, right? But if not, I'll let you scroll and see how you go flicking. Uh, so Brof's going to put up a little map for us of the region. It's very poor. I'm sorry. It's not helpful. I mean, well, it's, hopefully it's helpful, but it's, it's not great. It's just small, um, which gives you an idea of the area. Yep, next slide. There it is. Now, you'll see I've got the map on the left, and then we can't see in the room, but because we've got people in, uh, blocking it, but that's okay. Uh, over here, we've got Babylon, and then Assyria. This is very not to scale. All right, terrible map, all right. And what Isaiah does is he gives these oracles against all the nations surrounding them. So if you look in chapter 13, uh, he, gives, he talks about Babylon to the east, he says uh, in verse 19 of chapter 13, Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Babylon. They're pretty powerful. Don't trust them. And he says Assyria, chapter 14. Verse 25 of chapter 14, he says, I will break Assyria in my, in my land. I will tread him down on my mountain. Right? Don't trust Assyria. Next, if we move all the way kind of over onto the map that I've got, if you look down the left there, we've got Philistia, right? Which is where we get the Philistines from. And he says, Philistia, don't rejoice all of you in Philistia, verse 29 of chapter 14, because the rod of the one who struck you is broken. For a viper will come from the root of a snake, and from its egg comes a flying serpent. Right? He's talking about Assyria coming to wipe them out as well. Chapter 15, he goes on and he looks at Moab over here to the east. Right? That's it. Yep, that's the one. Uh, and speaks to them. Then he goes up north uh, in chapter 17, looks at Damascus, right, right up the top there. And then the northern tribes of Israel as well. Don't put your trust there. They will fall. And then he goes down south, right? He's covering off all points of the compass to Cush, which is kind of, I've got labels in words there, uh, which is kind of Ethiopia. And then further south to Egypt, right? He's covering off basically the whole world around them. He's saying all these other nations that you might look to for hope, don't do it. Put your trust in me. And the problem with all of these nations is the same problem, actually. Uh, their problem is pride. Pride. These people have exalted themselves above God, and so they'll be brought down. Now, we get a little taste of this in the passage that John read to us earlier in chapter 25, verses 10 to 12. If you want to have a look at that, Back in chapter 25, it says that the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain. But Moab, which is kind of, he's using them as a representative of all the nations around them. Moab will be trampled in their land as straw is trampled down in the manure. They'll stretch out their hands in it as swimmers stretch out their hands to swim. It's a gross picture, isn't it? God will bring down their pride despite the cleverness of of their hands. He'll bring down your high fortified walls and lay them low. He'll bring down them down to the ground to the very dust. Right, all these nations have arrogantly exalted themselves against God and his people. And God says there will be a reckoning. Now we saw on the map that it kind of went all the way around Judah. And you might say, well, that's what you'd expect, right? If, if Judah says, this is our God, you'd expect him to be opposed to all the nations around them. But then you get to chapter 22, and you see there that God's critique turns toward his own people. 
towards the people of Judah and the capital city, Jerusalem. If you look at verse 8 of chapter 22, uh, he's looking forward to this time when Jerusalem faced an enemy and looking at how they responded. It says there, The Lord stripped away the defences of Judah, and you looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw that the walls of the city of David were broken through in many places. What did you do? You stored up water in the lower pool. You counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down the houses in order to strengthen the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls of the water of the old pool for the water of the old pool. Right? Now you go through that list and you think, actually, if they were facing a great enemy around them, the things that they did there seem pretty common sense. Right? You, you, you store up water. That makes sense. You, you, you gather your weapons. You need that. You look at your defences and the resources you have available, the houses, and, and you kind of look to tear them down so that you can build up your defences. All these things, pretty normal, standard kind of siege warfare, like it's what you would do. All these things seem entirely reasonable. But you get to the last part of verse 11 and you see their great failure. And it's the same failure of the nations around them. He says there, but you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. Right? What is the first thing you should do if you are in danger and your God happens to be the true and living God, the God of the nations, right? We should pray, right? <laughs> Surely that's the first thing you do. If you, your God is the sovereign God over all, you pray. But they have failed to do that. They've been arrogant. It's a different kind of arrogance to the nations around them, but it's still an arrogance. And it's an arrogance that says that we'll be able to look after this by ourselves. We'll be able to exercise our wisdom to fight this in this situation, but we won't call out to God for help. Right? It's the kind of arrogance that says, I can cope. I'll be okay. I won't humble myself and I won't ask for help from you. Now, I wonder if that sounds familiar. I wonder if you can imagine yourself ever being in that position. Because we need to remember that while he's, this word is directed towards Judah and Jerusalem at the time, in this section, chapters 23 to 27, 24 to 27, Isaiah is looking more widely. He's looking at all people. See, pride was their problem, and pride is our problem. Throughout the ages, from Adam and Eve to the kings of Assyria and Babylon, to even the ancient people of God, and to us here sitting in botany, or wherever you are on Zoom, right? Uh, this has always been the human problem. We exalt ourselves against our maker and sustainer. We, we think we can cope. We think we can manage what life has to throw at us. And we say, I'll do it myself. Uh, sometimes we tell ourselves half-truths that justify actions which, which actually end up taking us away from God and his authority in our lives. Right? We'll say half-truths like, well, God wants me to be happy anyway. I, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. Uh, God's a forgiving God anyway. I, I'll be okay. Right? It's not that bad if I haven't set aside time to be with God this week. Right? These are small steps, kind of half-truths, but small steps which steadily take us further and further away from God. Right? We forget that every breath we take, every bite of food we enjoy, every sip of wine we taste is a gift that comes from God's hand. We're proud. We puff ourselves up against God's rule. We think we know better. Um, I know every day I reject God's rule in my life in some way because I think I'm right. I think 
I know what's best. I know better. It's a deep-seated human arrogance and pride that lives in every human heart. We're all guilty of it. Now, that's a disturbing word for us because God says throughout Scripture that he lifts up the humble and he opposes the proud. So if we are the proud ones, well then we're in a troubling situation. Now, the situation that we face is, of course, God's judgment. Now, the surprising thing here in Isaiah is that there's both judgment and salvation and they come together. And, what's more, that they are cause for praise. All right, this is this, our second point uh, about praise for God. Uh, have a look in verse 25, just at the start there, sorry, chapter 25, the start of uh, the chapter. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for, your, for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things. Things planned long ago. You have made the city a heap of rubble. Right here, city is representing kind of the world opposed to God. You've made the city a heap of bubble, at rubble. The fortified town a ruin. The foreigner's stronghold a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. See, the, the proud are humbled. Uh, therefore, strong peoples will honour you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor. So here the humble are lifted up. A refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud. So the song of the ruthless is stilled. See, the writer turns to God in praise, in song, and he praises him for his wonderful deeds, deeds that include both judgment and salvation. He praises God for humbling the proud, for bringing them down, as he did in those wonderful deeds when he brought his nation out of Egypt, right? He humbled the proud nation of Egypt when he provided salvation for the humble people of Israel. See, God's judgment and his salvation, well, his judgment is kind of like this tidal wave, this tidal wave that washes away the proud mansions that are built precariously on sandy beaches. But that's not the whole story because God's judgment is the tidal wave that washes away, but it's also the high ground that raises up those who he will save from his judgment. He provides both. And so Isaiah praises God for his coming judgment because through it, the nations will be humbled because that's what they need. Right? You note there, they need to be humbled for their own good. So you saw that in verses 2 and 3. God destroys the city in its proud arrogance and therefore the cities of the nations revere God. His judgment brings about salvation as he brings down the proud and raises up the humble. And again, this is not just for the people of Judah. This, is for, this salvation is for all people. Uh, it's a salvation that's offered to everyone who is humble. This is our third point, salvation for the humble. So if you look at verses 6 to 8, on this mountain... The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. Now, that's a beautiful picture. It's a picture that Jesus loved himself, of heaven, of, of the new creation. So here God is inviting the world over to his place. He's saying, come over. 
come take a seat at my table. I am preparing a meal for you. And it's a rich meal. It's the best of meals. It's, it's a, a meal of the best food available, the best wine you can find. God isn't here to stop us from enjoying good things. In fact, he is here to give us the best of things. He's not stingy. He's not holding out on us. He doesn't want us to settle for second best. And yet so often we think when we're going for the best, or actually when we are going for the best, we're actually going for second best. See, the rich wine, the, 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 the wonderful food that God has to offer us is actually the fellowship that happens around the meal. The fellowship with God. We need to remember that God is the one who sets the menu. It's not us. He knows what we need. He has a far better idea than we do. The things that we think will satisfy us. No, no, no. He invites us to come over to his place to share fellowship with him. So that's what's on the menu for us. Fellowship with the true and living God. But I never, I hadn't noticed this until this week. I wonder if you noticed that the Lord's actually at the meal too. But he has a different meal. See verse 7. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. The sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. We get the best of food and God swallows death. See, this is the the barrier that stopped our fellowship from God. There's always been this barrier between God and the nations. Our proud rebellion against his rule, which resulted in death, being cut off from the giver of life. Our sin separated us from him. But here, sin and death, the final enemy of humanity, it gets swallowed up or swallowed down. Now, do you just see how, how incredible this is? This is amazing, right? God justly punishes sin and death, right? This, this giant tidal wave that's heading for us on the beach that will certainly wash us away. But even as he sends this judgment justly, he comes and shields us from it and bears the consequence of our sin on himself. Jesus is washed away in our place. Right? He, he brings both the judgment and the salvation in the same act on the cross. Right? We, we see it revealed so fully, so abundantly. On the cross, Jesus received the full punishment of God's just judgment. The tidal wave was poured down on him. And in receiving that judgment, he provides salvation for everyone who's humble. Everyone who realises that they deserved what he received. Jesus is our shelter. He's our refuge, to take up Isaiah 25's words. Uh, it's a, a little like a scene from Bondi Rescue. Um, a little bit, right? We were drowning in the stormy ocean of our own sin and the judgment that we deserved, unable to save ourselves. But Jesus comes along in the rescue helicopter and was dropped into the ocean of our sin so that we can be plucked out of it. Right? He takes our place so we can take his but I think that's actually kind of a little bit of an imperfect illustration um, because there the lifesaver just gets taken by the sea. It's too powerful for him. It, it, it kind of overtakes him. I, I think a better illustration, and you won't see this on Bondi Rescue, but a better illustration is, is that instead of the rescuer being swallowed up by the sea, the rescuer swallows up the sea. He swallows up every last drop of sin, 
every last bit of shame, of disgrace, so that there's not one drop left. We go to the Lord's banquet table while the Lord himself swallows up our judgment. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Right, we are delivered from our judgment. We're welcomed into fellowship with the Lord God. That's what the feast is. That's the aged wine, the best of meats. Forgiven fellowship with God forever. And it happens through Jesus' death on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, when you see that incredible picture, what, how do we respond? What do you do with that? Well, I think it's what Isaiah does, and that is it sings. It says, surely this is our God. This is what he's like. We trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Friends, I want to encourage you to rejoice and be glad in his salvation. But I think to do that, you've got to do a little bit of self-assessment. You've got to ask yourself, where am I building my house? Am I building on the, the shifting sands that threaten to be washed away? Where am I giving my time, my talents, my energies, my, my loves? What am I devoting myself to? Am I proudly and arrogantly building for the future, thinking nothing can shake me. And so putting myself in danger of being washed away by God's judgment? Or am I building on higher ground, sturdy ground, growing in my relationship with the God who saves me? We need to be the humble, recognise our need. And if you are building on, on that solid ground, I want to say to you, I want to encourage you, live out this salvation. Re rejoice in your salvation, as Isaiah says. You get the best that God has to offer. Uh, listen to the words of John as he picks up on these words in, from Isaiah at the, um, the end of his book of Revelation, right at the end of the Bible. This is what we have to enjoy. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They'll be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, Write these down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost, from the spring of water, the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Friends, this is our God. Trust him for he will save you and rejoice and be glad in your salvation. Bronte's going to help us celebrate communion now.